I'm going to be presenting today the work of, of, uh, of several people, uh, work from Todd McDevitt's lab and, and, and my lab. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to talk about uh, this, this topic, which is, as you know, quite timely. This is an area which has actually received quite a bit of attention uh, in the press, uh, in, uh, here in the New York Times, an article about uh, COVID-19 and uh, causing a wave of heart disease uh, in the in the Washington in the Wall Street Journal, and actually uh, where they uh, cited some of the work uh, which I'll, I'll be talking about uh, today. There's, as you know, uh, th uh, thousands of deaths uh, from heart disease uh, every year uh, and new heart attacks. Uh, and, but and and now we have this wave of COVID-19 patients uh, on top of that which actually uh, now we think uh, are, and I'll show you some, some potential evidence uh, that uh, this will unfortunately contribute uh, to this heart disease. This was actually highlighted uh, in the, this today in the, the UCSF magazine uh, where Dr. Uh, uh, Nisha uh, Parikh has, uh, was discussing, discusses how it is affecting her practice uh, in, in disease, and, and we've uh, consulted with her about uh, early on, actually in the very first weeks of, of the pandemic uh, about uh, this particular topic. And I think the initial, um, what we've, what we, uh, this highlights is that the initial COVID heart damage causes inflammation of the heart uh, and uh, um, inflammation around the heart. Uh, and also uh, in rare serious complications, actually holes in the heart, tears in heart valves, uh, stress-induced uh, cardiomyopathy. And the question is who uh, is involved? And really this involves everybody from the young uh, to the older patients. Uh, and even among patients that don't have uh, signs, uh, outward signs of it. And that's, that's uh, particularly alarming. Now, just to many people are, are aware of the timeline here, but I just want to actually uh, put this in the context of uh, sort of when the first reported case was uh, less than a uh, year ago. Uh, and uh, when, and then now we're uh, unfortunately reaching essentially what they call the, uh, a new wave of, of, uh, of infections and, uh, and deaths. Um, Along with this time course, though, is also an early, early association with uh, cardiac injury with mortality. So people who had signs of heart disease uh, and a uh, sign of heart damage uh, when they were first uh, admitted to the hospital actually had a higher degree of uh, fatalities. And this was actually noted right in, actually in China uh, in the very, very first days. And that ca cardiac complications um, also are associated with uh, mortality and big meta-analyses uh, early on. What um, later on uh, in the pandemic, as it reached uh, Europe uh, in particular, and then in the United States, uh, people have then examined uh, patients uh, that by uh, echocardiography, which is a, a, a measurement of the you can actually see the, the heart uh, beating either using sound waves or magnetic resonance imaging, which is a more uh, a kind of a higher resolution uh, imaging. People have actually seen that there's actually decreased contractility of the heart of patients uh, in Europe and in the United States as well. And now what we're seeing is many long-term survivors thousands of long-term survivors who they call, they, they, they call themselves the long haulers, who uh, have actually uh, symptoms that is, are consistent with decreased cardiac function. And this is uh, particularly concerning um, and it's really a, a, a story in progress. Just today, I, uh, we saw this uh, in, in the, the journal uh, Science uh, for Students, and uh, the, the title here is even teen athletes with even mild COVID-19 can develop uh, heart problems. This is particularly concerning. You see, you notice, first of all, that these kids are, are playing soccer and they're not doing it with masks. Uh, but also the, the fact is that the, uh, even the younger patients who, uh, who have 
apparently mild disease uh, when examined closely uh, in terms of their heart, uh, they, can, they can actually see decreased cardiac function. And the long-term consequences of this, we don't know, but we can, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're trying to study that. So uh, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 is, the, is, the, uh, is the actual virus that causes COVID-19. And uh, we, we know that it causes frequent car, uh, cardiovascular injuries with 20 to 30% having shown signs of cardiac injury. And that they, this is a heart specific protein that can be found in the blood. They have increased mortality, as I mentioned, and they have inc people have in, uh, impaired uh, impaired cardiac function in a significant number of patients. And then uh, more recently, we've it will and and uh, Todd will talk about this is how their autopsy reports uh, have have initially failed to identify uh, cytopathic effects in the myocardium. But uh, after some of our, our studies, uh, people have been, uh, been sort of been, uh, will show evidence that in fact, when you look in the right place and the right way with the, looking at specific proteins, you can actually see some changes. So, um, so how do we model uh, human, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection in human cardiac cells? Well, the, uh, the, the cells themselves are, are, it could be different kinds of cells that could be made. And we really don't, can't actually take a human heart and infect it uh, directly. Uh, but what we can do is we can actually make these individual types of cells. And the theal cells would say, for instance, make uh, blood cells, fibroblasts, which hold things together, and the cardiac myocytes in particular, which are the ones that actually squeeze and, and cause uh, contraction. And I will mostly be talking about these cardiac myocytes. And we can make all of these from a type, a special kind of cell type called IPS cells or induced pluripotent cells. And I just want to talk about what are induced pluripotent cells to give you an idea of essentially what it is uh, that we're working with and what allows us to study uh, the cardiac cells uh, in, uh, in a plate. Um, in fact, uh, in, in uh, 2006, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who has part of his lab at, at Gladstone and, and, uh, and in UCSF, uh, Shinya actually uh, induced skin cells to become these pluripotent stem cells. And for this, he won the Nobel Prize in medicine in, in 2012. And what he, what he did was that he could actually take skin cells that were from a patient and take four factors, which we now call the Yamanaka factors, and induce these cells to become pluripotent cells, just like embryonic stem cells, but without an egg. No egg was needed in order to, to, to do this. And so this is actually uh, sort of the, the basis of what we have, because now these pluripotent cells, these cells that are like embryonic stem cells, can be make uh, any kind, many kinds of tissues. And just to illustrate what this, is, what this feat was, is that normally we think about development as sort of a one-way process where we actually have essentially a cells develop uh, from their pluripotent state and then can be actually made into different types of cells, like tissues like skin cells or heart cells and so on. But what was done with the reprogramming was just to insert four different genes. And then now the cell actually becomes like a uh, embryonic stem cell. And we can make an unlimited supply of, for instance, heart cells or blood cells. And these are things that we could not do before. And that's what that makes these cells so special and why we actually uh, use these cells uh, for these studies, because we want to study how does SARS-CoV-2 infect the heart. Um, just as, as a little bit of background, we can make many different kinds of cells and uh, researchers all over uh, UCSF are, are actually working on making peripheral nerves, uh, retinal cells, uh, even gametes like, uh, like uh, sperm cells, uh, islet cells, hematopoietic cells, all sorts of different types of cells. We're just going to be talking about the muscle cells, muscle cells from the heart. And it's also important to realize how what a disruptive technology this is, and really this is a local story, uh, in the sense that we just talked about the IPS cells with uh, Shinya Yamanaka, 
but also what we, we can actually take these cells and we can use uh, this powerful CRISPR technology, uh, which, was, uh, which was really decoded by Emmanuel Charpentier and uh, Jennifer Doudna, uh, who is uh, primarily based at Berkeley. These two papers, 2006 and 2013, are really the cornerstones uh, for, uh, for the work uh, that we're, we're doing. And we work uh, closely uh, with, with both of them. But when you combine these two together, and you can say, for instance, engineer iPS cells with CRISPR, uh, and for instance, add a fluorescent protein to them, uh, they can, you can actually get results uh, like this. So here, these are beating cardiac cells, human cardiac cells that are, 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 have been engineered uh, so that there's fluorescence now in these uh, long fibers uh, as shown here. And at the same time, at, at, and if it, they're the same uh, cardiac cells are now la labeled with CRISPR to, uh, to fluoresce in a different uh, region of the cell, you can see this sort of beating here. So having these powerful tools to now not only ha make cardiac cells, but actually to engineer them so that they can essentially report what we want to do uh, is, uh, is what our starting material was. And then we uh, start use that to actually now uh, to infect uh, the, them with a SARS-CoV-2. And so my colleague, uh, Todd McDevitt, uh, will uh, tell you about uh, the rest of what, what happened. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate it. Yeah, I just can sit there and look at those images and listen to you talk about for so, so long, knowing the, the history and how much you've been intimately involved for an audience who just saw those cells. That cell line that actually has been used probably more than any other iPS cell line now in the world, uh, uh, that was created by the Amundsen Institute. That's actually the cell line Bruce first produced. He's so he's very humble with this, but actually his cells, this, not his own personal skin cells, but cells his lab produced have actually gone on and, and been used probably more than any other line uh, and for all these powerful purposes. So um, what, yeah, I wanna get, get uh, into now is what was with all that background and with these problems posed, uh, I also like to tell a fun part of this is that, you know, this, this story only happened. I have to also give Bruce uh, credit, or I always say I blame him for the best projects I get to work on. And this is one of them. Uh, right when the shutdown was a, was starting, and uh, many labs, ours included and others, were shutting down many of our projects for anything that was deemed non-essential at the time, um, until you know we got better guidance and and ability to return to work. I had a text message which I sometimes shows just said Bruce says, "Hey, can you talk today at four thirty? Sure," and that was what launched all of this project uh, between us. And he was really the one that was first in tune with what was going on and had spoken with cardiology colleagues that there were hints of this, as he just said, long before there was really what we now consider uh, quite um, uh, much more definitive and, and, and a, a, much, a much greater wealth of data to actually go from. So when we first set out on this, these were sort of some of the initial questions that we set up with, with the group. First of all, in the heart, which cardiac cells, we weren't sure which ones could be infected or not. It was an open-ended question. And so we thought, well, let's use our tools to answer that. And if they do get infected, what happens as a, as a result of that? And even more so, could we, you know, the questions always with models is, has, is uh, uh, there's many jokes about models, you know, there's never a good one, they're all, they all have their flaws, they're always wrong. But in this case, is there any utility in what we can study in a culture dish that would actually enable us to, to relate back to the clinical scenario as it was playing out in real time, unfortunately, in front of our eyes? So these were the three main questions that we launched into these studies with. So we, as Bruce mentioned, we took these three cell types and we actually did a couple different things. What you're looking at here is just some quantitative data where we can measure um, after we've exposed our cells in a dish to the virus, um, quantitative counts. How many times can we detect a message uh, that is coming or a portion of that virus in the cells? And the two, first two ones, the, the acronyms cardiac fibroblast and the cells showed that there was very low levels. Virus might get in, we could detect something, but it was kind of at the baseline. What was very clear right away was what the CM, the cardiomyocytes, were the cells that had a lot of virus, orders of magnitude more. And if we did an experiment that was a, a sort of a, a quick and dirty sort of mixed tissue response, we basically saw there was no sort of additive effect. Basically, all of the message that we can see, it, it seems to be equal to the cardiomyocytes. And our interpretation was that really it was this one cell type that seemed to be predominantly the one that was getting infected uh, and productively infected, as we called it. And we can confirm this by looking at the cells. When we look for different markers, you're going to see 
in, in these cells, the green is just uh, some staining to see the cell body, the blue is for the nuclei. And it's actually the absence of a, of a purple magenta in these first couple of panels that said that the cells that were exposed to the virus, they got sick, they, they started to die. We could see it over a few days, even with a very low level of, of the virus first introduced. But it was actually when we started to look at the cardiomyocyte wells in our, in our plates that here now we start to see that signal. And we saw it in a lot of cells and we started to see it that it was oftentimes that this detection of the signal was in and around the nucleus. And as we now know, uh, Bruce, Bruce and I, at least I was, we were definitely um, not, not, very, uh, not very experienced in virology at this point in this, but we've learned a lot from our colleagues in particular, I should mention Melanie Ott, who's been our collaborator on all of these and enabled us to do the enviral infection studies. But this is a classic sort of appearance that basically demonstrates that at this stage of the viral life cycle, it is hijacking the cell's machinery so that it can make more of itself, which is exactly what it wants to do. Um, now we looked with this with a couple different markers. And the only thing I wanna say about this, again, all of them shown in magenta here. If we looked for things such as the first one is uh, the, the, mess, the RNA, that is the viral strand. So this is known as a, 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 vi a, a RNA virus. If we looked for some of the proteins that the virus makes in our cardiomyocytes, we saw different appearance or patterns of these. Um, and these are giving us snapshots and an indication in a very global sense that this virus is interacting within the cells in all sorts of different ways. And this is again, just sort of from the visual side, uh, showing just sort of things starting to quickly run amok within these cells and these different punctate or diffuse appearances that are starting to show us basically uh, the virus and, and the different stages of its life cycle with that. And then when we looked with another micro microscopy technique, in this case now, this is about a thousand times more powerful. What that enables us to do is rather than just look for remnants or pieces of it by the antibodies we used on the left in those fluorescent pictures, on the right-hand side, these grayscale ones with an electron microscope actually enables us to see the virus itself. Now, these viral particles are 50 nanometers, so they're very, very small. Each individual cell is on the order of about 10 micro, micrometers or uh, microns in size. That's about, an, uh, as I said, a thousand fold difference. So we have to look very powerfully, but what is was interesting to see, but also very alarming, is that you have these little vesicles, these bags basically, or, or, or pockets that are forming inside of the heart muscle cells, and they are chock full. Each of those ones um, of the, the dark little halo is what's called that spike protein. It's what gives it the name of this virus, the corona or cor class of coronaviruses, because it looks like a corona around the outside of it by this type of contrast uh, uh, in the microscopy. So this basically also just further confirms there is definitely absolutely virus in here. And the, what it's doing is that it's actually using the cardiomyocyte as a factory to make a much, much more of itself before these bags get deployed out into the cardiomyocyte or out into other cells. So that started to answer the first question. Yes, the cardiomyocytes get infected. One of the things we can start to do, and this is not a, exactly like what you would see in vivo, but it has its parallels. And so the plate in the middle is just to give you a visual representation. These are these multi-well plates and we would seed cardiomyocytes in different wells. And then we can study very uh, various conditions. So this round image on the left is where we've used a microscope technique that will scan the entire well. So we're looking at all the cells in that well. And on the left, what we actually have is that the start of an infection. So we infected with a very, very small number of, a uh, very low number of viral uh, vi virions, as they're called, to the numbers of cells. And what that enables us to do is that you can see is that it doesn't go everywhere initially then. It starts sort of in one focal spot, that lower corner, and it appears to start to be uh, spreading out. Not every cell is necessarily showing that staining pattern at that time, but it's sort of a way to do like the, the time lapse almost of what's going on. And what we can see at the end is if you look at later points or if you used a higher infection as another way to simulate, you see that the whole well is infected. It's taken over all the cells in all the regions. So the parallels to this could be, again, when you think about uh, the instances when they talk about whether you get exposed to a low amount or a high amount, this is sort of a way to simulate that and see what might happen. And then also study the consequences of that um, by using our the cells, unfortunately, as the 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 uh, what we can sacrifice safely in a dish to try and get some insights into the biology that's going on in, in, the, in the midst of this uh, viral infection. So one of the other things we we're interested in, this is just uh, maybe somewhat confirmatory data, is we can use this platform, we've been starting to look at it more, where we can actually take some of the clinical therapies that are either being examined or being postulated. Um, I'll say half jokingly, we didn't look at hydroxychloroquine in this one, 
Um, we did jokingly say that if you put bleach on these, the, ble the cells will absolutely die as will the virus, but that wasn't a very interesting experiment. So we didn't actually do that one, uh, but we know that one would be the case. Uh, we're not advocating for that either is what I would say. Uh, but what you can see here is actually the, on the first two panels, you see these, this healthy control, the vehicles, the DMSO, it's with a, uh, uh, just means that it's, it's absent of the drug, but we give it the same volume of, of an agent that it would be exposed to. And you see that it's purple and it lights up. So basically that's not preventing the virus from getting in or replicating in the, in the muscle cells. If we use something like an ACE2 antibody, and the reason ACE2 is that's the receptor that the, the virus is using to get into the cells. If we put an antibody in that blocks it, you can see pretty clearly, and this is obviously high magnification, but we know this to be true now, is that you actually can attenuate or really blunt the ability of the virus to get in. Um, and that would be one way in theory to do this. Now there's other problems with that if you start to hijack ACE2 because it does play roles in our normal biology. So there's some concerns about that. And then there are other drugs, E64D, I won't get into details, is another that blocks some of the entry. That's good. Remdesivir is a different class of drug. Remdesivir is, is one that we've heard a lot about in the news. It's an antiviral. It will definitely kill the virus. It does a good job at that. One concern we have, though, is that if you look at just that picture, I'll tell you, and you'll see more data in a second, that's not a very healthy looking cardiomyocyte. The linear green strands that we normally see that show that that contractile machinery seems to be broken up. It's very punctate. It looks very disrupted. And so that's a sign to us that actually the drug, and it's actually been known as we went back and looked at remdesivir at, at, as it's approaching its, its um, um, effective dosing range can have adverse effects on, on cardiac muscle cells. So this would be a concern to say that we could look at drugs that might be effective at the virus or different stages of the therapy, but we can also study if they have some adverse consequences as well. And interferon beta is another it's in clinical trials, which is actually one that does also a very good job. It's not pictured here, but it's actually one of the better ones we've seen. So getting into this um, uh, uh, dysfunction of the cells and disruption, there was a number of hints we had, but really the visual was the key. And there's been a number of ways we've helped confirm this. And this is again, sort of an even more zoomed in picture of these nice uh, green striated fibers in the cells. You can see they're all mostly aligned in a similar direction that happens naturally as the cell beats or contracts. And so this is basically that machinery is the the contractile machine that enables these cells to beat as Bruce was saying properly. So this is under the healthy conditions or if they never saw virus. If we take the exact same neighbors of these cells, the same batch, but we put them in a different well at the same time with the virus, unfortunately, this is what we see. <laughs> and this was shocking to us because we've never seen anything that at, at least to this point that exhibited this kind of disarray within a heart, uh, cardiomyocyte. And there's a number of ways you can challenge them at, with drugs or uh, other types of insults to try and you know see what negative effects they have. But this seems to be pretty dramatic and pretty fast. This is happening all within 48 hours in a dish, which suggests that if a virus were exposed and it gets into the cells, you'll see it quickly. Um, the other thing with these that we saw that was alarming was in other cells, cardiomyocytes, normally where these white arrowheads are showing on the bottom, there should be a blue dot in the center. That blue dot again is the cell um, nuclear DNA. And in each of the cases, what we noticed is normally each cell has at least one of those. Sometimes it has more than one in a cardiomyocyte. But we see several where they're gone. And this was concerning us because again, as we look closely, it wasn't every cell and it wasn't like uh, uh, in every region, but again, it tended to be in pockets, almost like those little foci that we showed at the beginning of this or earlier when you see the virus sort of spreading throughout a culture dish. Um, and as we looked into this a bit further, one of the things we could see, and as we did some of our different analyses, is that there's a number of proteins around the um, nuclear membrane that would normally hold that intact and keep that nuclear DNA um, hopefully withheld where it should properly be. But it seemed that there were some disruptions in that, and we're still working to further confirm that, but it seems as if that that might actually help us to explain, and it's given us new questions and hypotheses to dig into a little bit further for the, the mechanism or the cause. Um, so the other things with this, uh, just want to show is that with that um, in hand, as Bruce said, we now felt like we had at least two features that we felt were, or we knew to be very abnormal, the disrupted myofibers and the, the nuclei that were missing from cells. And so we started to be able to reach out to other colleagues at various places. And especially early on, it was quite difficult to um, obtain uh, autopsy samples. Uh, for one thing, just safety. A lot of places weren't doing autopsies. Uh, because they weren't set up properly with the uh, uh, p uh, proper protection equipment or facilities with ventilation to ensure that the people doing the autopsies were safe and wouldn't get infected themselves. 
So here's a picture of a healthy heart sample that uses control. It's cutting along these fibers. You see lots of pink healthy uh, staining. That means healthy muscle cells in this picture with lots of those purple nuclei. But when we started to look at some of the first COVID patients we saw, there's a couple of concerning things here. In the patient one up above, we could see, for example, some of those red arrows highlighting where we saw nuclei that were disrupted or appear to be missing from, again, the muscle cells, which we could tell because of the pink color and the striations. And we saw this in, in several different regions within the heart, not in every region, but in several parts. And in patient two, this is one that was actually diagnosed with a case of myocarditis. So you see a lot more white space between the muscle fibers. That's a sign of edema or inflammation. But again, in these, we see a number of the nuclei that appear, appear to be missing in places where we would normally uh, expect to see them. So it's concerning. It's hard to be definitive with these when you're looking at autopsy. We don't know the history of all these individuals and if there were other insults and stuff. So that complicates some of ours, but it was very striking that we knew we had a specific feature and looked for it and we could find it in COVID patients. And we're still following this up with more samples to find out about how specific this is or not. Um, but the other one that was concerning to us was going back to the myofiber. And Bruce made a, a really good point about this earlier, which is that as we were following the autopsy reports, the purple and pink pictures you just showed that's the standard for the field. And that's what most autopsies are done with in terms of staining. The pictures here are shown with this fluorescent green and this blue. This isn't routinely done. This is not a standard assay. It can be done, but it's not something that would be typically ordered for an autopsy. We do use it routinely in the lab though. And so we took the same staining techniques to say, okay, let's see if we see something similar. And we did this with these age match controls where we had either unfortunately younger or older individuals to try and take into some of the aging accounts. And really, if you focus on patient one in the, in the upper right there, a number of these regions and where the white arrowheads are is again showing where we have missing green stain, which suggests that again, these myofibers have been disrupted. There's inconsistencies. The my, the, and this, this again would disrupt these cells, even without being able to look at their own functional data, this would not enable those cells to beat properly. And in, in aged individuals, we again saw patterns of this as well. But like I said, sometimes it can be hard to tell what was what might be due to virus and what is due to other age, aging or comorbidity effects. So just to summarize these, and then we can open up for hopefully um, great discussion, questions and answers such, is that we th feel like from these and, and additional studies we haven't had time to go into all the details is that we definitely know now that this virus can infect human heart muscle cells. Um, it seems to prefer the muscle cells over some of the other human cardiac or cardiac cells that we're aware of. Um, this does induce some severe, what we call cytopathic or basically pathologies in individual cells. Um, and we've identified what those specific features are and continue to quantify and characterize why those are occurring because that's really important to know. And these, the, the thing that was really striking about this and goes back to the power of iPS cells uh, in particular is we could actually now use a system that otherwise didn't exist as Bruce said as of 15 years ago. And we can use this to actually predict features and pathologies. And that's sort of opposite from the way things often go, where you look at patient specimens, you try to figure out what might have happened, then you do an experiment. This was sort of opposite of that, and it was really interesting to, to use the tools that way. So for us, the things we've been spending a lot of time discussing is really now dig in even deeper. If we can figure out the causes, that gives us specific targets. That enables us to think about new ways that we might be able to protect the heart from these viruses, or at least attenuate some of the potential damage. That might be particularly important if, it, if unfortunately, we keep hearing about asymptomatic patients and long hauler effects. Um, and also, the, the, we're trying to do more and more validation of these studies, which requires us to look for more and more samples, more diverse backgrounds, different time points and such. But the thing we're also excited about, because we were very, um, I'd say, bothered by the fact that this is a very sort of downer story, very, net, very concerning, and that was uh, uh, disheartening for us, was the fact that actually what we can use this for and what we think we can do is that since we have the controls, we can actually think about using this, these concerning results, but spinning them on their head and using it hopefully for development of potential therapies. So that's something that we're now actively working on with, the, with this group that we um, have been a part of. So just to conclude, this is a, a portion of that and the number of resources. This has been an amazing time to be in science, not just because of, I'd say the types of game changers as Bruce said, IPS, and um, CRISPR technologies and other uh, sort of uh, technology development, but also the fact that so much has happened so fast and how people have just across the board felt compelled to jump in and do what they can. Both Bruce and I felt that way. And this group in particular, I won't go through everyone, has contributed basically anything that they could 
but I we would be remiss without highlighting really, you know, Bruce and I spend most of our time, unfortunately, on Zoom like this, talking to each other and with other people, often from our homes, maybe sometimes from our office. The group that really deserves the credit are the ones that have been brave enough to go in in these circumstances. And this is the uh, six of the main people right here who constitute the primary authors. These are all postdocs, research associates, and graduate students who we are fortunate enough to work with. And really, it's been their just unbelievable effort and energy and enthusiasm that they put into this. Um, so without them, again, we, this would never have happened and just very, very thankful and lucky for it, as well as several of the sources of funding, um, some of which we had before that we leveraged for purposes like NIH funds and others that, that uh, philanthropic ones that have, have donated this cause specifically and enabled us to, to really accelerate what we could do. So I think that will stop there and then Bruce and I can open up for hopefully uh, uh, lots of good questions. Thank you both. That was a fantastic presentation. Appreciate it. Um, we have some good questions here, which you can see in the Q&A. So uh, Eli Solomon asked us, um, how does infection in cardiac myocytes compare to infection in other cell types? For example, most of us would think of like lung cells uh, or kidney cells, things like that. Uh, great question. What I would say is that uh, one of the things here is uh, these specific features, some of the ones we said, the myofibers, those are just, those are muscle cell specific. So that's one thing is that they're specific for those. You wouldn't find those proteins in any of those other cell types. Um, the infectivity question, just how well virus gets in or not. We, we were not the best prepared, but what we can tell you that Melanie and her group has said, because they've infected lung cells and kidney cells and heart muscle cells. And what they were surprised by when we started these studies was that our the heart muscle cells were among the most easily infected and they replicated the virus as well as the cell lines that they use to make the virus. So there's a, a monkey cell line that they use to produce the virus that they use, use for testing. And actually the, the heart muscle cells work sort of on an equivalent basis producing as much virus. So uh, a lot is what we would say compared to some of the other cell types that we can test. Um, so Mary Merce, Murphy asks us, um, do the endothelial cells that line blood vessels have the ACE2 receptors? So we would call COVID-19 a vascular disease. And could this explain some of the cognitive effects, damage to small vessels in the brain, but also some of the, maybe the cardiac effects or some of the, and uh, uh, granted, it wasn't the blood vessels that you showed us, or some of the clotting, blood clotting effects? Yeah, I, I think that the, I mean, we, we were surprised that the endothelial cells that we used were not infectable, uh, mm -hmm. but I, we do think that blood, that doesn't mean the, that the endothelial cells in the body are not infectable. Uh, we also, um, but, but I think a lot of the vascular effects are thought to be due also to clotting, increased clotting of this of the of of the, the the blood vessels. So, it's it's a complicated issue and it's very hard to to control. So we don't know uh, exactly um, sort of how what the relative role is. What we do know is that the virus does infect cells that have the receptor, the ACE2 receptor, and the cells that have those, uh, those, um, those receptors are car cardiac cells, some endothelial cells, but also the, the kidney cells and the, and the cells in the, in the gut, essentially the, 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 uh, the, the, some of the, the in, in the gut organoids that, that has been shown. There are not what's what's kind of curious is why there are effect what the how the effects of the nervous system are uh, are manifest because in fact uh, the neurons themselves pure neurons don't seem to have that receptor but it could be that there are some types of receptor uh, cells which are supporting neurons uh, like uh, the uh, like the microglia and things like that that might have the receptor and, and, and may be infectable. Uh, so that, that part is, is much more mysterious, uh, I would say. Oh, great. Um, yeah, it's, it's really uh, impressive that based on your models, it's the cardiac myocytes that really seem to be one of the main uh, targets and promoters. Um, so it's fascinating. Um, uh, Corey Silver asks, is there any evidence of the cells or the cell nucleuses, cell nuclei being replaced or healed 
after they're infected uh, or hit with the COVID virus? Yeah, I, I can uh, I can take this one. And actually, if um, if you want, you might the the second the next question is related. I can answer both together if you want. Mm, yes, please. Okay. Uh, so Ian Finnegan also has asked, what is the mechanism behind that disappearance, which is related to if we know why it's causing it, can it be healed or not from those? Um, and is it po how is it possible for a cell body to remain intact while the nucleus appears to be completely gone? Great questions, because these have been things that we've been kicking around ourselves and trying to figure out this doesn't make sense. Or what. So what we'll say first, to uh, best of our knowledge, if a cell were to lose all of its nuclear DNA and it's it's physically gone, there's no way that that cell, um, I think Bruce was quoted before using the term brain dead, and that's probably a good way to kind of put it on the cell level. There's no way that a cell can regenerate. The template, if it's there, it can regenerate that template and make DNA, but if it's gone, it's gone. So that would be extremely hard or unlikely, um, and that's also why we were concerned seeing some of that in vivo is, you know, how, how could that be a, a, a re repairable sort of situation. However, in the case that how could it be missing, there's a lot of the structural stuff around it that might be keeping those intact. And what we even saw in those cells in a dish, even when the blue stain, the nuclei, nuclear DNA is gone, the rest of the cell remained largely intact. It hadn't exploded, at least not as of yet. Now, maybe it's a temporal thing. We just haven't waited long enough to see the sequela. And that's one of the challenges with this is you're sampling across lots of cells at slightly different stages. So you don't know always when you're exactly you are because you can't we haven't been able to do the live recording ones yet, which is something we're working towards. So it is possible that that could be the case, is that you have that um, nuclear disappearance. It may it may proceed in some of the cells, and yet the rest of it may sort of be structurally in place. Uh, we actually also think it could be that there's might be timing between when the myofibers start to weaken, and it could be that they're pull they actually connect to that membrane and there there's tension. If they weaken, it could be that it it pulls apart, and that could actually disrupt that membrane. And if that's the case, you might get loss of it that way. Um, again, to be fair, wildly speculative until we can actually see something live happening, but there's different ways. Uh, the other way we put it is, you know, Bruce has said for some of these, we just don't know which way the tape is running sometimes when we look at the snapshots, what's what's forward and what's reverse in some of these processes. And the and the reverse would be really important because may, some of these could be re re repairable. And the myofiber disarray is a big one. Even though that happens, that's something that if the cell is still viable, it could fix itself. Uh, yeah, it's probably got a lot of analogies to a, a heart attack where, you know, the the cells have died, but they're, they, they haven't fallen apart. The heart is still together. It's, it's, uh, but the cells that do die don't come back in the infarct. And you also tend to get a big region that the pathologists especially would readily identify and say, that's where the infarct was. What has been mysterious is the functional data says there's a problem with this heart or hearts, they go in and look structurally, but it's hard because you can't do aut autopsy ones until the patient is deceased, unfortunately. So there has been some some confusion around this because they some people went in looking and in the myocarditis, which is the other classic definition for in any infectious disease that infects the heart, we showed one sample of that patient that looked really bad and had clinically been diagnosed. The majority of the of ones that we've come across with pathologists have not been diagnosed as myocarditis, and yet you can still find these features. So it suggests that there are, again, varying degrees of this. And and again, going back I think to some of Bruce said is, you know, the, there's the virus infection, the viremia part of the heart, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. And it could be that the cytokines in the blood, that's an effect that we are also attempting to model. Um, it's hard right now because we really need to sample from patients to find out how much that varies and what are the, what proteins should we be even testing because there's so many cytokines. Um, and so we're looking into ways to try and do that as well, to, to build upon the complexity and to further refine our ability to um, answer those questions better. Um, but it, yeah, it is. It, these are great questions because these are the challenges we keep kicking, we keep debating. We could almost channel these questions to your next three years of research. <laughs> um, so you, you touched on this uh, from William Chang, but how do you differentiate heart damage post-COVID versus more common ischemic etiologies when recovered COVID patients develop chest pain. So that's, uh, it, it, I, I think he's asking more clinically, uh, how do you differentiate? Are they having a heart attack or is this damage from COVID? So, yeah, I can, I can try to uh, address that. I think, I think we really don't have, uh, you know, this is such a new thing 
that we don't have people that are five years out of COVID, for instance, uh, so that we could even know what that would be. Certainly with other viruses, there are post-viral syndromes, uh, such as you know, post-polio uh, myelitis, uh, there's uh, there's di different types of, or even uh, I think about scarlet fever. My father had a valve uh, disease from scarlet fever, uh, and uh, those uh, those sequela, these long term sequela of uh, the viral infections, are something that we really uh, don't know. But I think that my our, my guess is, uh, and and this is just a guess, is that it's going to be. Uh, very similar to a cardiomyopathy, where essentially all the muscle uh, essentially is is decreased in function, and it'll be very difficult to tell the difference between kind of a standard, uh, you know, genetic cardiomyopathy versus one which is not. And one of the things that that Todd and I talk about also is how does this you know reveal itself, uh, you know, in the future there might be cardiomyopathy genes, uh, genetics, that wouldn't have revealed themselves until you were 120 years old, but now they will reveal themselves when you're 70 uh, because you've had this insult. And that's, the, that is our, that's my prediction that the cardiomyopathy, which is actually a heart failure, which is already on the rise uh, in the country and increasing every year, uh, that kind of cardiomyopathy will become more common in the future. That's that's only a prediction, but I do think that the the, the what we're seeing in the patients right now is essentially very much like a a, a, a cardiomyopathy, a global cardiomyopathy, rather than an ischemic heart attack uh, like like event. And so my prediction is you're going to see some version of that. Uh, you know, 30 years from now, where people will have that as a question on the chart when somebody comes and they have a f heart failure, uh, that that will be a contributing cause. That's that's my that's my worry at this point. So I I, I think the next three questions are all drawing on that. And I was going to say, if you can go to that Sp Spencer Robinson's question, because it's a great follow up to what Bruce just said with that. And I think we can both weigh in because there's this is partially. Uh, uh, do you want to say the question first? Sorry, I didn't want to. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, they all touch on this. It's it's basically we're, we're being taught that, you know, a small percentage of people who are older or have pre-existing health conditions get really sick. Um, and then most people are minimally affected. Um, so like, is there, and, 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 and we're not really talking about sequelae or you know, long-term impacts of the people who were not severely affected or really, really sick and ended up in the ICU. Um, is, do you see that happening? Um, and Ian Finnegan also brings that up, the severity of the cardiac sequelae in the 60% with mild to moderate COVID-19. Everyone is thinking this and everyone wants, I think this screaming in the headlines, like wear your mask, not because you're gonna be, go into the ICU, not because you're the 5% who will go into the ICU, but because you are the however many percent who are gonna have heart damage and have heart failure at 60 instead of 90. Or, so anyway, thoughts on that? Many. Um, <laughs> so I think we'll both we'll both probably want to weigh in because this is something. So what I'll give is a bit of a background, because one of the reasons why for this and I'll say is, um, you know, we we maybe, you know, we don't have a full picture on this right now. That's the, the simplest way to start. And when Bruce and I especially did, were discussing with the trainees and others, we put this out there and not for um, uh, press media purposes to get in the spotlight, but we put it out because we felt that in the discussion, the point you just raised was being completely overlooked. And this is only one example. We don't know what's going on in the brains of people that have fuzzy fuzziness and complaints and long haulers. We don't know if there's other tissues or organs or systems that could suffer. Uh, I've been trying to think of other ways to put this too, is that, you know, science has been moving at a rapid pace but six to eight months is is nothing when it comes to these things. When we talk about diseases we've been that the whole scientific community has been working on for decades and is only now making inroads on and new insights, 
it's not to complain about or anything. I think we, you know that the the mobilization that people have had has actually been quite powerful and helpful. But along that, the realization that something you do today might affect you down the road is not a new lesson that we've seen from medicine in general. And unfortunately, infectious agents have have a great history of show, illuminating new areas of biology and new mechanisms we had no idea existed until they manifested themselves. And Bruce just gave a great example that things that are sort of hidden in our genomes, uh, masked by our lifestyles, or our good genes, you know, mask our bad lifestyles. All of that, you know, we, we just don't know. And so not to make any light of it, it's really give us time. Think about the consequences that maybe there are some negatives. And we don't know, we have no idea the genetic variants and the ones there's the very first genetic one just came out like within the last month that was basically just highlighting a, a mechanism that was already known is that if basically you're poor in interferon, that you're going to, you pretty definitively fall in the, in those are the folks that fall in the severe category. But the severe category is not full of only those folks. It occupies like 5%. The other 95%, we still don't know why they, we can't give a reason why they fall in that cohort. So this is going to take time. And um, the safest thing, the best thing is to avoid this. And it was honestly our care and concern. I, I was really upset when thinking about these and saw that when we saw the muscle cells and talked amongst ourselves, we knew that result in May. And we not sat on it. We were pushing, pushing for publication. Others and other things came out. The echocardiography one, the question about this, we were we were thinking too, oh, this is the severe case. And, the rest of and then all of a sudden functional studies come out in recovered patients that had never been hospitalized. And they're they're not, you know, uh, back in a bed, but their their cardiac function is not normal. Why would that be? And we this was the kind those were the kinds of influences, at least for us, that said we should interject this into the conversation as one example, but unfortunately, I think there are since then, and there continue to be more. One other subtlety one we've been, you know, critiqued from getting the science side was, well, but the they can't find the virus in the hearts. So when they stain the hearts of the patients who have deceased, the their vast majority, they we cannot detect, like we showed you those cells in the dish, where we can see it really robustly. We take those same reagents, those antibodies, we put them on the heart tissue sections, and we don't see it, but we see effects. So what did we miss? Well, one of the things we've, we think is happening now, and it's only happened in a few of these, is that patients who die very suddenly, those are the only ones so far to date in published reports where they can find the virus. What does that mean? What we think it means is the virus could hit the heart, hit it hard. It might get cleared by mechanisms, but the damage has been done. And if that's the case, then by the time a person dies, which will take time, especially if they're in the hospital and getting hopefully you know, proper care, the virus has escaped. And so it's escaping detection. And that's, again, a reason why we can test things in vitro to see if that's happening or not. But we're certainly, you can't biopsy people's hearts and you're not going to biopsy a sick person's heart unless there's a reason to do so. So th we're not going to know. There's a gap in that knowledge that's just very, very, very hard to fill in. Bruce, go ahead and weigh in as well. This is one I'm very passionate about when we hear these for all the reasons you just brought up. <laughs> so uh, when when uh, Todd, uh, when he refers to uh, put it out there, it, we should mention that all of this work is actually unpublished in a peer-reviewed journal. We put this out in what a preprint form uh, and in what they call bioarchive, uh, so the public can have it. And all the press coverage and stuff that we showed before was based on that preprint. And we're still moving through the the review process right now. And I think and it will be published uh, via a peer-reviewed uh, journal, but. Uh, that takes time, and the the the, the t time is of the essence. And I think this whole preprint process was extremely valuable in terms of of actually sharing information and so on. The, just to just to to take a, a a different slant on what what Todd said, I agree, totally agree with him. But I think that just imagine that you have a um, a healthy uh, you know essentially a football player um, in uh, Ohio State football player in particular. Uh, where uh, they uh, are are really are work, are performing at, at maximal uh, abilities, and maybe you lose twenty percent or thirty percent of your heart function, that you're still going to be able to operate completely normally, uh, and twenty or thirty percent uh, of heart function is going to be uh, really very very uh, you know sufficient. And you you you're going to you're never going to go to the hospital. You just have a cough, and then you go back. And um, 
but the, we noted that this, this was noted because actually the people at Ohio State did MRIs and did, did uh, of, of the hearts and actually saw in patients, who, in football players who were not actually did, did not need hospitalization, that they saw this uh, re remarkable uh, decrease in heart function. Now, some of that has recovered in some of the patients. And so there is hope at least that, uh, that this, some of this would recover. But what we, what, what we worry about is sort of the long-term sequela of the same football player now, 30 years from now, if they had had inflammation and scarring at that place, that, that this could, this could uh, sort of raise, uh, rise again. And then now imagine now you have an, uh, a 75 year old or 80 year, 80 year old person whose, whose cardiac function is less and now they lose the 20 or 30%. That's what we see in the headlines. That's what people say, oh, that, that those are the people who have uh, essentially, who go to the hospital and 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 uh, and and unfortunately, some of them die, and that's because they don't have that reserve. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's almost a similar amount of damage is occurring in both of them, percentage-wise. Uh, but it's just the amount of reserve that you have uh, when you've you've you, you've maybe had an MI uh, a heart attack before or you have some underlying heart disease and so on. And that's, and so, so we think that really it's, it's very possible that the amount of damage that is going on is comparable in a, a young patient as an older one, but it reveals itself differently with respect to uh, how uh, they see them, uh, how they actually are uh, present at the hospital. For, and and what we're what we just don't know, and even uh, Tony Fauci actually brought this up as well, is you know thinking about other types of viral syndromes like this that they they can come, you know they things can come back. Uh, so this inflammation that occurs in in other diseases um, that are that you know causes an insult uh, can you know rebound uh, maybe with the virus. Or maybe just a a, 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 a essentially a um, a, a, a uh, your body's response uh, to that. That inflammation then lights up an inflammation pattern uh, that goes on and on for for a long time. There's there's a, and there's a number of cardiac conditions. Chagas disease is one of them, which is very common in South America. There's an infection of a parasite which causes inflammation in the heart and then 20 years later results in that inflammation results in actually something like 25% of the heart transplants in Brazil are a result of this uh, the 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 Chagas uh, disease so so there's 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 definitely precedent for this and that's the whether the virus comes back or it's just uh, the really what they call the sequela where it's the uh, the inflammation or the uh, that that uh, that sort of rebounds. So that those that's what we're really worried about. Thank you. Um, so Cindy Wan asks an interesting question about the remdesivir, um, the apparent in vitro effects of remdesivir remdesivir destroying both the cell, both the virus, but also the cardiomyocytes was surprising, given its apparent clinical benefit. Is this of concern for future usage, given the rise in uh, weaker heart function post-infection? I, I, I think I can answer that. We, this, uh, the, the amount of remdesivir that we use in a plate is uh, at least uh, tenfold or uh, maybe a hundredfold more than what we would use. Uh, the, the toxicity that Todd referred to uh, is 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 a known toxicity of uh, remdesivir, and and many drugs have cardiac toxicity. Um, we can use more in a, in a plate, uh, and to, just to sort of to to to, and that experiment was done to prove a, a somewhat different point. But the regard, regardless of that, it does by using higher doses, we can reveal uh, the toxicities, uh, and there are many drugs that are used uh, for chemotherapies. And and other types of of of, of uh, therapies that are are commonly given 
do have uh, cardiac effects. And one of the things that we do worry about is essentially um, what, you know, essentially whether or not it'll affect one person more than another because of genetic predisposition and so on. And that's another area that we, we and others are, are working on. The, with remdesivir, I think it, it's, it, these toxicities are really what limits the dosage uh, so they know where it is. So I, I think that be, because of the studies that have gone on with remdesivir, I, I think that people can rest assured that they're, you're going under the, the cardiac tox, toxic dose uh, in the patient. They, the dr drug companies would probably want to go higher uh, to get or to to actually eliminate the virus more, uh, but they're limit, but obviously limited. They don't they they don't want to hurt the patient, so that's why they limit it there. So, and the, there is one minor point too for those for Bruce. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, cardiotoxicity screens and things like that are done on healthy cells or in a usually a healthy animal. You know, normally you're not being challenged at the same time with the agent that you're trying to so. It could be, again, there's a combination that under some of these circumstances, but it is definitely a dosing effect. And, and the problem, as he said, is you go lower, but now the virus might escape the drug effect, so. Um, so let's see, I think we answered Ian's second question. What's the severity of cardiac sequelae? We don't really know just yet in the patients with mild to moderate disease. Um, what kinds of heart pre-existing conditions are most important in terms of the effects of contracting COVID-19. I, I think that's referring to when would you be the most sensitive to the effects of COVID-19? Yes. The, there's, a, there's one comorbidity which anecdotally keeps coming up, but it's not surprising perhaps, but there's, it's, it is obesity because of the complications it has in multiple systems. Um, I will just say, you know, uh, uh, Again, talking with other research, things like that, some of these cases and things, people in their 30s, when you're seeing severity of some of these cases, one common factor is obesity that seems to be coming up in some of the reports. But again, that's purely anecdotal and back end. It's not a, there's no, we don't know that yet. Yeah, but we don't, I, I, I think the, the question is how, uh, we don't think that the heart is the primary place that infection happens. We think that the, uh, that the lung is the primary place where the, the, the virus goes. Although there is evidence, mounting evidence, that you can get uh, COVID from the eye, and you could imagine it going from uh, through the eye and bloodstream directly to the, to the heart. We, there are some cases uh, which, is, which are surprising where people have passed away from cardiac complications and have very minor lung ones. So there is a possibility that uh, either it, it seeds from the lung directly to the heart very quickly and for in, in certain unfortunate individuals have very severe effects uh, in the heart. And the, the, in fact, the very first patient that died in the United States of uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, from that was, that, that got it from another person uh, through transmission was in Santa Clara, and she was a woman who had no known uh, risk factors, and she actually had a hole, essentially a hole blew in her heart from from uh, the open, and it took months for them to actually for the coroner in um, in um, uh, in Santa Clara to actually get testing because the the lung findings were very mild. She had very, very uh, a mild uh, congestion in the, in the lungs, and yet she had this essentially a hole in her heart that just kind of uh, that, that she died of instantly that was caused by uh, the the virus. And at that time, the CDC would would not actually even test uh, this this patient, uh, and it took uh, almost two months for them to finally uh, do that. And when they did, that established that this was actually the first. Uh, uh, case of, of transmission of, of COVID-19 in the United States, uh, documented death, and it's it's a kind of ironic that it was uh, it was a, a cardiac event uh, and with a mild pulmonary one. Well, yeah. So our 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 previous speaker educated us that if you're going to travel by plane, you should definitely wear eye protection as well as a mask. So um, 
and probably when you go to Costco, you should wear eye protection as well as a mask. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think we've learned tonight conclusively that, that COVID-19 is a cardiac disease. Brad Klein asked us what interventions might protect our cardiac myocytes early in an infection. Any thoughts about that? That's one of our big questions. Some of those ones we showed, we can show some ways if you just can keep the virus from t contacting and getting in by pre preventing viral entry. It's a pretty good way of keeping at least out of the heart, um, we think, from those. Now, again, that's what we can model the dish. We don't know if that's the same exact route as Bruce was saying in a person's heart, but we think that that's the safest one. The, the challenges with that is you know, how do you do that? And, and the, you know, the ACE2 is abundantly expressed things. These antibody ones, those are, those are very expensive. They're not widespread sorts of things. So I guess if, you know, if you can get the kind of care that has the frontline antibodies and the rest of it, yeah, you can get that. But that's not standard of care, nor will it be for some time. Um, so again, it goes back to sort of the preventative measures being our safest bet because we don't understand the other uh, genetic variant or, or other factors that would, would, would be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, one, one clinical intervention that I think is actually quite doable and has uh, universally been uh, uh, basically um, ig ignored by any suggestion that I've made uh, and and, and is, is certainly not clinical uh, 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 standard of care is that even if a young individual would come in and they were actually being uh, treat they they had COVID disease and they had no other symptoms no severe symptoms if you could draw a a, a blood test which is uh, for troponin and they had a troponin level that was high, that would indicate that cardiac cells are dying. Um, those, I, I, would, I would support at least the concept that those young individuals who have signs of cardiac uh, cells dying should be actually put uh, advanced to a, a therapy for instance, of say, say the antibody uh, therapy to the spike protein. So the this uh, both uh, I guess it's there's there's actually something like over 80 different companies that have antibodies to different parts of the virus. Uh, two of which are approved, uh, one from Eli Lilly and the other one from Regeneron. And those uh, actually that block the spike protein. That is expensive, but it, it, it may, it's worth, I think it's be worth trying uh, to see whether or not you could lower uh, the, the um, sort of the area under the curve for uh, the troponin, what they call troponin leak. Uh, because, uh, you know, for, in fact, uh, Jeff, you, you brought up how this is similar to a heart attack in some sense. And in fact, it's exactly the exact same test that we use, the troponin levels that we use for cardiac, uh, for, for heart attack. And it's the area under the curve that is for the troponin that actually measures how much heart damage is in a, uh, in a, uh, a, a myocardial infarction. And it's possible that you could lower that by lowering the viral burden, even in somebody who had Zero other, zero other symptoms except for, for that. But right now the standard of care is not to draw even draw that test or not even do that test at all. Uh, and uh, because essentially it would it increases the, you know, if you have a hydroponin level uh, in, in a young person, you, you're almost obligated to, to admit them to the hospital under certain, you know, for, for standard of care for an MI. So it's a complicated issue but that's the kind of thing that I think, you know, as we now have therapies for early disease, um, you could imagine where that would be worthwhile. But it could be a long; it's a it's a tough trial to do, and it would be uh, it would be hard to do because uh, it'd be very difficult trial to do because you really don't know what the outcome end outcomes are for them. It's, it's so it, it is complicated. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I have to say. Um... So do you, do you have an idea of what percent of patients who are hospitalized have an elevated troponin test? Because as an emergency physician, I think most of the patients that 
come into the hospital come through the emergency department. Um, I think that we do check troponins on most of those patients. We check like a, a lot of tests for troponins and D-dimers and things like that. And uh, just based on my recollection, having seen a fair number, not many have detectably elevated troponins, but I'm curious because that's just completely anecdotal. So yeah, no, I think it's back. a relatively small number, but the but the uh, but the but the point is that you could have it from an outpatient who has no yeah. symptoms. Yeah. That's the issue, and, yeah. and and that and that's the thing that's not done essentially. I think it's a small population overall. Some, some of the earlier one, it was 20, 30 percent of COVID patients, but again, there's a subset of those patients. So, so this is going back to notes we had from some of the background slides, but it's very much depends on which study those are pulling from, and we've we've been trying to be careful and take the most conservative estimates in many of those cases for what it is. So, whether it's hospitalized or not. But that's not in the ER. That's actually patients right. who were already in the in uh, already in the uh, you know close to being intubated, essentially. That's, yes, that's they were, they were hospitalized. Yep. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Huh. So yeah. So um, yeah, that makes so much sense. Like to to stratify the organ damage based on who are going to get these very expensive antibody medications. So you know, people are not getting the same care as the president. Just slower than the president, they're getting very different care, and. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, this is an excellent point of some of the people that you might sort of take out of the population and treat them, even though they don't seem extraordinarily sick. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, let's see, do you, do you anticipate an exercise intervention will inspire the cardiac myocytes to recover faster from moat healing and at what point in the recovery to exercise to restore the heart? It's probably the opposite, I'm going to guess, is what the cardiologists are going to tell you is, Layla, wait, wait until the troponin levels are down, your function looks better. Um, there, is a, there is an area of, the, of regenerative medicine that's called rehabilitative ones, but that's mostly in the musculoskeletal, you know, use it or lose it kind of thing. But the heart, when it's under this kind of damage, is sort of a little bit of the different, typically, I think. I, I just also anecdotally, I've seen like the sort of the young, healthier people they feel a little wiped out after their initial COVID infection. They're bummed that they're not getting feeling better and they go out for a run. And that's when they tend to get sicker. Like a weekend, they're starting to feel better. They're like, I got to get back in shape, go out for a run, get sicker. That's, again, hmm. I don't know if you guys are seeing that, but uh, I've seen several people that that's happened to. It's not, hmm. I haven't seen it reported. But, all, all, hmm. all our COVID patients are in a dish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't talk back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, Tom Hancock asks, can ACE2 inhibitors help stop the cardiac infection? Great question. Yeah, so so it's so it's a little bit it, it, it's deceiving the 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 ACE uh, it, it, the 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 ACE inhibitors actually uh, there's a series of enzymes and ACE2 is what the uh, the the virus infects, where is uh, it's the it's the first ACE that is a totally different enzyme, which the which uh, the ACE inhibitors affect. There was a concern uh, early on uh, that the uh, because it's in the same pathway that people who are on ACE inhibitors would be more in, uh, in uh, more likely to be infected. And there was uh, one uh, study uh, where it, it seemed like people who took ACE inhibitors had increased ACE2, which is ACE2 is the, 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 uh, um, the receptor for the virus. Uh, but all of those seem to have turned out to be untrue or uh, it didn't, didn't pan out in further studies, I should say. That so that in other words, the it, people the the recommendation to stay on it has been always to stay on the ACE inhibitors, and uh, it in in large scale studies it didn't seem like people got more infected by them, uh, but like I say, they're they're they are involved in the same process, but the uh, the ACE is not uh, is that that the. The ACE inhibitors that you you uh, that people many many millions of people take 
is not acting at all on the same protein. It's several steps away from the ACE2, uh, which is sort of is, is involved in the same thing, but is not uh, by, by any means the same uh, thing. Now the spike protein is the spike protein that people make the uh, antibody to, the Re Regeneron antibody and, and, uh, and the antibody from uh, Lilly, those antibodies are actually do block spike and spike is what actually engages with the ACE2 uh, receptor. And that is, uh, that is really, uh, it's just, it's, it's very good news that, you know, a lot of people made a bet that that would actually work and it seems to. Uh, and then also the spike protein, which engages the ACE2 uh, is also what the vaccines are uh, made to. So in other words, uh, the, the, the vaccines from Moderna and from, um, uh, from uh, Pfizer and uh, BioNT are both, are, are both actually make spike protein and that spike protein is what uh, is, uh, is, seems to be very, very effective and it's a great relief that that's the case. Uh, you have everyone captivated. We have a few more questions, and I, I want to do a follow-up of that last question. So it sounds like you're saying that the ACE inhibitors don't have any impact on making people more predisposed or protecting them from infection. There's another class of ACE receptor blockers that um, also are for high blood pressure, and is, is that the same for that class? That's that's also true. In other words, they, they it's in it, all, all again on the ACE, uh, which is different than ACE two. Uh, so it's a different. Uh, so so the the uh, the the ARBs, uh, the the angiotensin receptor blockers. Again, those are 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 spectacular drugs. Uh, have have been proven uh, to be beneficial for heart failure and are um, and. And actually, when the pandemic be first began, I was personally very concerned about it increasing. Uh, and and I uh, brought this up to several different cardiologists, and and uh, they uh, they said, well, the recommendation is this, and the studies are out. So I was worried about this. Uh, and uh, but in fact, uh, I, I'm now convinced uh, that it's that it's not a not a problem. That, that's great, great to hear. Um... Why is hypertension seemingly such a, 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 a worry? Why is it so consistently panning out to be a risk factor? Because I, I think, you know, the other things like diabetes, maybe you're immunocompromised, obesity, you might be um, also, you might mask infection or have uh, more of a load on your organs. But it's, you know, why is hypertension such a worrisome problem in this world? I, I mean, I think, I mean, hypertension is, is, is a risk factor for heart failure overall. Uh, so it could, it, it could be kind of a, uh, a, um, a imp, how can I say, imprecise marker of some general cardiac dysfunction. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that's, that, that's really all, all I could say, but I, I would say that if you're, it, it, regulating heart failure, uh, it, 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 it heart blood pressure is in, incredibly important. Can I, I could put a spe very speculative or potential hypothesis would be a tough one to test is, you know, if you're, we know, we don't know yet, again, as Bruce said, how does this virus get throughout the body? If it's not, you know, if it starts in the lung and it's getting to other organs, then the most likely culprit is, is our circulatory system. It's got to be getting through there. Some way. We don't know of other magical ways that it would somehow traverse those, those sites. Um, so I think anything that's in there that disrupts the properties of blood vessels in one way or the other, that it permits transit maybe out from the lungs and now also into other organs, you, you basically, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your plumbing is not solid or in its right state, then basically you are now maybe just becoming generally or grossly more susceptible. And so that, that you know, that's a very simplistic, I, I realize, but, you know, just trying to think through it from a sort of physical side, it might be. And that's why I think, you know, you just, if, you know, all these other complicating factors, how much do you, is in your lungs, does, does it escape? And if it does, can it get into other organs? So something like that, that could be a commonality that would link a lot of these different ones and then and is one possibility. It sounds like in the end, we should uh, 
as opposed to listening to the doctors, just listen to our mothers and grandmothers who said like, wear your mask, eat healthy, exercise, get enough sleep at night, and you'll be okay. <laughs> uh, last question from Corey Silver. Hearing that, that some blood types A, for example, carry increased impact risks from COVID-19, does that have any impacts on your research? I can respond to that a little bit. I think that the, the blood type, uh, exactly what the blood type means is still unknown. Uh, the, the, the blood type uh, is a, a crude marker for a large piece of DNA with lots and lots of different risk factors that are on it. Uh, and so it's, um, and, and but I, but one thing that to 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 so so the short answer is we don't know the the uh, the the perhaps more uh, longer answer but I'll try to make keep it short is that uh, the genetic risk factors are the great teacher uh, of for for this so in other words there's large studies of people who are uh, who who have a susceptibility to different types of disease and I think. I'm hopeful that genetics in the um, in in people uh, and and these studies will actually reveal to us uh, some things which make us more resistant, uh, more resilient, uh, and uh, and and hopefully recover more. And I think that those are types of things that we can potentially do, and we can recapitulate those. The beauty of the iPS cells is that we can take those clues that are from the human genetic studies. And then just pop them right back into the, and test them out directly, uh, and 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 we can eat you. So if the that large piece of DNA, for instance, that has the type A uh, blood type has ten different genes in there, we can examine each of those uh, individually. And once we sort of hone down, we can then try to get at molecular mechanism. Well, we are extraordinarily happy that both of you and your teams are working on this problem. And thank you so much for sharing this, this really remarkable approach and the lessons that you've learned thus far. We look forward to hearing more in the future. And again, thank you very much. Um, I think you've kept everyone completely captivated for the hour and a half here. So take thank care. You so much. And Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Great questions. Great.